Hi, this is Beatles author Mark Lewison, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about what's going on news-wise in the lives of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, and you know me best for a program that I host called Every Little Thing, a Beatles syndicated radio program. And I'm joined by my co-host on this show, and that's Steve Marinucci of Beatles Examiner. Hello, Steve. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we're going to do something that we did right around this time last year, and um, this is a fun thing for me to do. I started doing this back in the 80s when my Beatles show was on WDHA in New Jersey, a Sunday morning program, and when it came to the end of the year, I would invite some friends of mine to the show, Al Sussman being one of them, who was a recent guest on the show, and we'd talk about the past year and highlights of the past year, and... um, I thought we'd do that once again. We did this a year ago on Things We Said Today, and uh, I thought we'd talk about what we feel are the top five releases of the past year for Beatle fans. And I want to specify releases because uh, I was wondering if I should also include events, meaning concerts, in which case I'd have to include Paul McCartney, having seen him in... uh, in Brooklyn at Barclays Center. But I thought, I wasn't quite sure if we should involve that because, you know, when it comes to Paul and Ringo, their dates are kind of scattered. Mm-hmm. And so many people never get to see them because they're just in certain locations for a few dates during the year, and that's it. In the well, case let me, of, let me you know, interject. You said no events meaning concerts. Um, but I one of my five is an event, but not a concert. So, uh-huh. We can we can we can deal with that when you, when we get to it. I'm I'm even talk about it first. Uh, that may be my first uh, first thing. Okay. Actually, well, no, I thought I think it will be my second. It might be my second thing. But I thought we'd stick to either um, albums, uh, audio, video, or books. Well, when you see what this is, I think it it'll, it'll be justified. We'll get to it. We'll we'll <laughs> see. I'm I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to go over you, but. I think this is is worth mentioning. So, well, what I thought we'd do is we'd each have our top five. Okay, but I think that we should also have some honorable mentions. We will do that. So, should we do those first? No, I think that let's keep the honorable mentions till last. Let's do the let's do the uh, the biggies first. Okay, I will say first though that this was really tough. It, it's no kidding. It, it was only tough because there are so many things that happened in the past year, and it's very easy to overlook some. In fact, I probably have overlooked a couple. Yeah. In my list. But, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to hear what you have to say, and, and, uh, and then I'll reveal mine. So why don't we start with you? Well, for the, for the fifth pick, I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit and combine two things. So my fifth pick is On Air Live at the BBC Volume 2 and Beatles Bootleg Recording 63. You're the reason com- I'm you're combining, combining them is because there's so many uh, BBC things in the bootleg recordings. It's almost an extension of extension to the two together the reason for the bootleg recordings aside we all know that it has to do with copyright extension but the fact is that they dug into their archives for all this stuff you know even if they even if the circumstances were different for the two things and they pulled out and they pulled out you know these recordings and they in some cases the the recordings are improved are much improved Especially on on air, which I was listening to earlier today. So, but it's it, you know for whatever reason, it's it, it's nice to have these things out again. As I've said in the past, it'd be great to have the the full shows. And God only knows down the road we may just do that, knowing the way Apple is. But even if we don't, it's great to have all these things out again. Okay, yeah, I, I will. I will definitely. Uh agree with what you just said right there. I will admit, though, and, and this, this applies not just to the BBC recordings, but to Beatles recordings and solo Beatle recordings. Mm-hmm. I listen to so much of their music as a mix, 
You know, I don't always listen to Beatle albums all the way through. I cherry pick certain songs. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the BBC recordings, I like, I love Volume One. <laughs> Live yeah, with I the do BBC. too, actually. And, and, and I've heard several people say they like Volume One better than Volume Two. And I'm getting, I'm kind of getting used to it. Uh, it's, it's settling in on me. It didn't settle in on me right away. Uh, listening to it today, I, I was a little more comfortable to, with it than I have been. And I do like that. I I do like bootleg recordings. I know there's been a lot of grumbling. Um, I've, I've been talking to several people who don't particularly, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues with the bootleg recordings, but um, and especially the price for one. Um, but you know, it's there, and I'm glad that they they pulled them out and they made the uh, the improvements that they did with some of the recordings. So I'm, um, you know, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with that it took me it, it, i originally wasn't even going to mention them together but really to you know they really deserve to be together right? okay is right. that your fifth <laughs> yes it is oh, we okay. better not have the same top five here <laughs> i hope not i don't All think right. so if you said five releases i told you one of mine is kind of is not really a release okay but we'll we'll see what happens all right okay. what, what's number four number four i'm going to say good old frida Okay. Good old Frida. Uh, good old Frida was such a great surprise. You know, it started out as a project that they that they almost, you know, they were kind of hoping would happen, and then when they when they did the Kickstarter, you know, fundraising, they were surprised that it, you know it went over the top, and then it, I mean, and then there's so many things about this project that are so wonderful, especially Frida. And Frida, if you're listening, you're, we mean that. I mean that sincerely. You, it was, it's been so great to get to know you and to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And and it's just it, the whole film. The film is wonderful. Now that it's out on DVD and I can sit and watch it, you know, all the time. It's it, it's not. You can't get tired of it. It's just great. It really, really is. And I know. And and um, Larry Kane told me several months ago that he thought it was Oscar worthy. And I. God, that would be just fantastic. I, you know, I don't know if that's wishing on a star, but boy, I'll tell you that it, it's such a fantastic documentary. I, I, it deserves at the least it deserves to 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 be rated highly and and given all the acclaim, you know, that, because it's such a fantastic documentary. There uh, we go. I couldn't agree more. I think, <laughs> but I think that. Um, what, what are you laughing for? Oh, I'm just I'm happy. <laughs> I know you are. You've been raving about this DVD since the very beginning of I the have. film, and, and rightfully so. If this uh, documentary does so well that it, it even gets nominated or her profile becomes even bigger, this is going to be a nightmare for her mm -hmm. <laughs> because she doesn't want the spotlight. She really doesn't. Well, she's just, she's just a very unassuming person, and, and you know the fact that it took her all this time to, to do this and she had to be talked into it and everything... Again, you know, with the contact that we've, that you and I have had with her, she's, I mean, she's, she's just, it's just, it couldn't happen to a nicer person. And I'm really glad that, that, uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very happy to, to make it part of my top five. Um, I, I can't say anything else. That's okay. So, there we go. Let's move on. Number three. Number three. I picked an event and, um, I actually just thought of this at the last minute and I, and uh, when I thought of it, I said, I can't leave it out. And that's Brian Upstein going into the Rock Hall of Fame. Oh, I don't know if you, that's, yeah, it is an event. And believe me, we're both ecstatic about that. I don't know if that, I wanted this to be releases, really. Well, I, there were other releases to mention, but I think that's such a big thing. And I had other, I had a whole bunch of things down, but I think that's significant enough that he's being honored, that, um, that, that, no, uh, I mean, if I if you want me to plug a, if you want me to put a release in there, I guess I would have to say uh, rock show. But I really think that the the Epstein Epstein going into the Rock Hall is significant enough that it's one of the five biggest things of the year. My okay. thinking. All right. I mean, there's there's no argument. We both wanted this badly, and so many people have been campaigning for this. Right. You know, he's such an unsung hero and someone that everybody overlooks. Most people overlook. Mm -hmm. And certainly when you when you study Beatle history and you realize his extreme importance, you wonder, you know, if if the Beatles would have ever happened 
without right. him. So, yeah, definitely, without a doubt, <laughs> you know, we're we're thrilled about that. Um, I have I a think... feeling your your number one and your number two are going to be the same as mine. Probably. I, okay. Probably. Right. Um, I just have to decide which one uh, is. Uh, I I think number two is going to have to be Eek Paul McCartney New. Okay. Um, Why do you say Eek? Because <laughs> when you hear my number one, I'm gonna I'm I'm probably gonna probably gonna get somebody's gonna probably say something, but I don't know. But Paul McCartney New. I mean, we we uh, you know he surprised he, he he did a masterful job of of letting everybody know about it. With the, especially with the, uh, you know, with the uh, the revelation the uh, the night before, and all that, and it's just and uh, the and the album turned out to be great. I mean, it's it's such a great album, and it's been well, it's been one of the best things he's ever done. And uh, for a guy his age to come up with a, an album this good is pretty fantastic. And and uh, it was actually much better than I thought it was going to be. So, uh, you know, I'd, that's just, that's another time. The second time you've said that, it's almost like you don't expect him to put out great music. Um, with his history of albums, uh, no, I didn't expect this one to be as good as it was. I really didn't. And, and yet, uh, you do feel that his most recent albums are amongst his strongest. Mm, no, not really. I didn't particularly like Chaos and Creation that much. Wow. I know everybody else did, but I didn't. I didn't like Flaming Pie that much either. Whoa! I, that, but, wow, there's a lot one, of McCartney fans. I really that like. Disagree with that? Okay, but tell me why you think this is one of his best. New kicked it off actually. When when New was was released, um, it was such a great song. And as I said on a past show, right after it came out, I I uh, listened to it straight for you know just back to back to back to back to back to back to back. And I, I I didn't get sick of it. I mean, it 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 was such a strong song. It stuck with me, and uh, and I loved it. And uh, when the album finally came out, um, with a couple of exceptions, I liked just about every track on it. Um, there were a couple that didn't that didn't floor me, but there was enough variation and variety on the album that it was well worth it. I the only, if I have a criticism about it, I'm not sure that the whole idea of the of using the um, the different rec- the different producers worked as well as he hoped it would. Why do you feel that way? Because I think there was a it, it probably took away from the unity of the album um, a little bit. But uh, that doesn't mean the album is bad. I mean, I like it's like I said, I like the album. I think it would have been a little more cohesive had he used one producer, maybe Giles. But I'm not complaining. I mean, I, I'm really not complaining. I'm not being really critical about that. Hmm. I think the album is great. So. Okay. I have a feeling I know what number one's going to be. Yeah, <laughs> you probably do. It's it. It's, there's only one other thing that can be can be picked, and that's Lewison's Tune In book. Uh, I mean, we all waited for it. We all knew, you know, and everybody was going crazy, and it turned out to be as good as everybody expected it to be. The revelations were fantastic. We will be talking about them until Volume 2 comes out. And even after that. <laughs> and even after that, yeah. I mean, you know, it's just, it's it's amazing. And I, in fact, I saw an article the other day that said the book has made everyone reevaluate Ringo. And if that happens because of that book, you know, that's a great thing uh, to give Ringo a little more, a little more credit. So... Well, apart um, from being a great drummer, it really makes you realize what his life was like before the Beatles and that he was already established as a drummer, and he was really doing quite well for himself. Right. And not only that, but he held his own with his own full-time job. You know, mm-hmm. he was the only one, He was the first one to have a car. Right. You know, so little things like that make a difference. He, w- he was well-known in yeah, Liverpool. Yeah, and that Rory Storm CD that came out last year... Uh, Really, kind of, even though he wasn't on it, it gave you kind of a hint of what he had, of what he wor- had to work with before he joined the Beatles. And he, it, it, his, I mean, he had some, he had some good groups to work with before he got to them. And then, and they knew what they were getting. They knew they were getting, the, you know, a great drummer and a great personality. And so, for that, you know, that, that says plenty. And there's, there's a lot more there too, obviously, besides Ringo. But, you know, that's one of the main points of the book, but in any event, 
Hmm. There you go. There's me. Okay. So do we want to do honorable mentions, yours? You want me to do how many? Do you want to do five? Is that what you want? Yeah, or maybe we'll just we'll we'll end the show with honorable mentions. Yeah, let's just end the show with honorable mentions. Okay, so then I'll do my five. Go ahead. There's a slight difference from yours. Go ahead. (laughs) Actually, number five is on air. Really? Uh, Okay. But um, it does kind of make sense to do what you just said to combine that with the the bootleg recordings in a way Mm -hmm. because they came out so close to each other and. You know, the, the bootleg recordings have, the bulk of it is, BBC. BBC material. But, you know, the BBC recordings are just um, a part of Beatle history that I'm more appreciative now than I've ever been. I've always liked it. And for, for so many years, before the first volume came out live at the BBC, I always said that the BBC recordings was the, the greatest treasure trove of unreleased recordings from the Beatles. And I held so much weight behind those 36 songs that they did for BBC Radio that they never released. Mm -hmm. I mean, I treasure those, even though the earliest ones, the ones with Pete Best, the the sound quality is not that great. Still fascinating to hear all that stuff. And, um, you know, now more than ever, and I, I know I've said this before, it makes you realize, you know, what a great live band the Beatles were without hearing the screaming fans in most cases. It also gave you a glimpse as to what the Beatles were discovering musically at that time. What they right. were picking it was, up, it, and and it was really fun back in the in the days when I was just getting into, I, I should say, just finding out about bootlegs. <laughs> that you know the BBC stuff was BBC stuff was so much a part of that. I mean, I remember one of the first ones I remember seeing was Yellow Matter, Matter Custard with all those. BBC recordings on it, and I mean, it, you know that the BBC stuff was one of the the big uh, big things that was bootleg outside of the the uh, the Get Back album, you know. So. Right. But for me now, apart from those thirty six songs, which I probably will always rate first for mm-hmm. the BBC recordings, because you know how great it is to have them, to have any unreleased songs uh, from the Beatles that they didn't release for EMI. Uh, but I, I'm learning to appreciate more so now than ever before the other recordings. Mm-hmm. And I really find it far more fascinating. Even though I've heard these before, I go back and forth with them. I can spend a while without listening to BBC recordings at all and then go back and it's and it's like, uh, you know, the greatest feeling in the world. It's euphoria here in some of this stuff. And when mm-hmm. I hear even the slightest variations in arrangements of their songs, I find it really fascinating. Even and, something, and, you know, and yeah, that's, that's the fascinating part that there are variations to those songs. Even just, um, you know, they they added a chord at the very end of "P.S. I Love You," mm-hmm. <laughs> something as simple as that. Or as I've said before, I like hearing certain songs where you're so used to hearing the harmonica and it's just removed. Mm-hmm. Like they they did that several several times with "Chains," for right. example, on the on the new collection. Right. Um, and in listening to the bootleg recordings that just came out from 63, mm-hmm. even though, I, as I said, I've heard these before, but sometimes I forget the different arrangements. Um, mm-hmm. A Shot of Rhythm and Blues, there's a version there that's much faster than the version that we're used to hearing on Live at the BBC, mm-hmm. something like that. And then I also notice how on a song like Too Much Monkey Business, George's guitar playing is fantastic. Mm-hmm his lead guitar playing, certain things that, you know, it's easy to forget or overlook. And then you go back to it and it's like, wow, you know, uh, you learn to appreciate this stuff more and more. There's so many reasons to appreciate those BBC recordings. And I'm really glad that these uh, these two compilations came out. And like you said, Steve, sound quality on On Air is fantastic to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, also, not, not so much on the 63 stuff, but the but On Air is really the... the you know, who's the choice of stuff? You mean the bootleg 63? Right. But, right. you know, another thing I was just thinking about, listening to the, the bootleg recordings of 63, it ends with at the very end of 63. So in my mind, I'm thinking, they're just weeks away from coming to America. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this is what they sounded like. And it makes you realize how ready they were. Right. So, so many reasons to appreciate the BBC stuff. And apart from all that, ever since the... The Live at the BBC, the first volume came out in 94, and then you had the anthology collections. I love all those booklets <laughs> that mm-hmm. come with the package. I love Kevin Howlett's notes. I love reading this is the recording date and this is the transmission date and a little bit of background on each song. 
something like what you heard about Beautiful Dreamer, mm -hmm. that the Beatles had heard a version from Tony Orlando at that time, and it was a bit of a rockin' version, and that's what inspired them to do that version. Right. Little things that, I'm not sure if I had read that before or I'd seen it before, but just little, little, um, you know, anecdotes and, and tidbits of information really makes it more fascinating to study mm -hmm. this stuff. Uh, my number four pick is Rock Show uh, for the simple reason that it's, it, to me, it was the apex of Paul's career in terms of commercial acceptance. Okay. He was, you know, at the top of his game then, and it's fascinating to see this now, and uh, the the picture quality is for the most part excellent, although there are times when it appeared to be grainy, went back and forth from sharp to grainy. But the fact that it's been out of print for so long, and finally, you know, it's out after all these years, I'm so grateful for that. Kind of like, you know, let it be, we're waiting for that. It's the same kind of feeling, but um, it's such an important part of Paul McCartney's career that a lot of fans now who never witnessed the whole Wings period you know, to watch it now and see Paul do a show with a band and presenting it as a band with Denny Lane singing five songs and Drew mm -hmm. McCullough doing one song. You know, for people who have seen Paul in concert since 89, 90, since that tour, where it's so Beatle heavy, this whole thing is kind of foreign to them. <laughs> and right. I'm wondering, you know, any new fans that have seen Paul in recent years and they watch this, what are they thinking? It's such a different time. And it's so fascinating to watch. And it's, you know, my favorite tour of all from any artist. You know, I, I love the Wings Over America tour and uh, everything about it. And I'm just so grateful that it's out. Well, let me ask you why you picked Rock Show over Wings Over America. Because it's, because it's the film or? Well, I didn't. <laughs> well, you didn't. Because Wings Over America is number three. Ah, okay. <laughs> there you go, Steve. There I go. Um, I don't even see how it's possible not to put Wings Over America in the top five because the deluxe box set had so much, had more than any other deluxe box set that Paul's put out so far. Okay. And I will say I absolutely treasure the deluxe box set of Ram, but there's so much that he packed into Wings Over America. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first heard about it, the description was more bells and whistles in this box set, and it's true. It really is. There's four books that come with it. You got the extra CD with eight bonus tracks from Cow Palace. You got the DVD of Wings Over the World. And those four books have so much in them, and they're all different in their own way. You've got Linda's photos there. You've got the book with David Frick's notes, which is really a, 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 great, a great book to learn what you need to learn about Wings in a short read, the whole history of Wings and how, mm -hmm. it, all, uh, how it all happened. And even giving a lot of respect to everybody who was involved in that tour, including the horn section, right. where they all came from. I just love that whole aspect of that. And then there's Humphrey Ocean's book with all the, the drawings, which I know you said you weren't crazy about. Right. But the fact of the matter is that he had an artist, Humphrey Ocean, who was there throughout the tour, and whatever he felt like drawing, whatever he witnessed, whether it was wings on stage or backstage or any intimate moments, that's what he did. And, and it was, The nice thing about that set was it was so obsessive. It was, you know, I mean, everything, every aspect of that tour was documented, and that's really fantastic. And as, as and one thing, and um, it's not in the in the book, but um, and I, I mentioned this. I was talking to uh, Peter Asher this week. Peter Asher's show, the latest version of his show that I saw a couple months ago, has a picture of him and Linda Ronstad with Paul and Linda. And I asked him, I said, where, where is the picture taken? He said backstage, he thought in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And uh, that picture is not in the book, as I recall, in the Wings Over America book. But there is a it just had, I just happened to think about that because I, I mentioned we were talking about that. But there's another, you know, there's another uh, picture as far as documenting uh, Wings goes. Yeah, I remember a story being told that Linda Ronstadt, who is a huge Paul fan, mm -hmm. um, she was touring at that time, and she had a concert scheduled when she went to see Paul, and she ended up being late for her <laughs> own concert because of that. And her fans were a little bit upset about it, but... I never heard know. that. That's a great story. Yeah. Well, I don't know if Linda actually got to see the concert, or, or she just met Paul at the mm -hmm. beginning or b before the concert. But, um, yeah, 
<laughs> Peter didn't tell me whether they met before or after, but he did say that. I mean, the picture is there because I did see it, and he did he did confirm it. He did talk about it, and he thought it was he thought it was Los Angeles. He wasn't positive. Yeah, but Wings Over America was just so lovingly put together. It was, and uh, you know, if you like. Um, Anything to remind you of that time, replica tickets, you know, a replica mm -hmm. pass to the to the end of the tour party. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that that were packed into that box set. Uh, I really think that they just did a fantastic job on it. Okay. You know, the only thing that I ever complained about, and I said this on our show, is that I wish there was more bonus audio. You know, because mm -hmm. I care more about the audio and more unreleased music than anything else, and I love all the books. Don't get me wrong. He should have put he should have put CDs of every show on the tour. <laughs> <laughs> that would have that might have made you happy. No, I I would have rather have heard rehearsals from the tour. Oh, okay. There we go. That's okay. That's fine. Okay, That's so um, number two is is all these years tune in from Mark Lewis and okay, and it's just it's, you know what can you say that hasn't been said already? It's. Mm -hmm. uh, He's writing the the you know the whole trilogy here, three volumes of what will probably become the the ultimate Beatles biography that everybody refers to, and uh, you learn so much in this book. Interesting that it, you that you picked it two and I picked it one. Interesting. Yeah, well, you know, it's. I, I've often said that if if you learn one thing in a Beatle book, it's worth the price, but. In this book, there are so many revelations of little things you never heard before. Right. And, you know, for some of us, it may not matter to know certain things. It may be too trivial. But for me, I'm fascinated by all of this stuff. Well, yeah, and I, yeah, I am too. And I think it's a, I mean, it's an obvious landmark book. And I think that's the reason why it deserves the, you know, it deserves, you know, the way I pegged it as number one. But to each his own, you know, what can I say? You know, and the other thing is that there are so many Beatle books that have come out there, and they just retell the same old stories over and over with without doing any digging, without doing any research. Mm -hmm. And Mark Lewiston is the exact opposite. He's yep. he loves to do research, and he does painstaking research. And this is someone that um, you know has integrity in, in his work, and it shows. Yep. And uh, that's what I love most about his stuff. Just learning what we played in our show about how the Beatles got their contract with EMI, which yep. to me, oh, yeah. I, I'm still turning my head over that. <laughs> when you've been hearing the story a certain way for so many years, and right. there's any variation on that, it's fascinating. And this yep. is a complete twist. <laughs> yep. it, 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 takes the, it makes you realize how... There's so many twists and turns in the Beatles' story and how everything unfolded and how if this didn't happen, then maybe something else wouldn't have happened. Right. And the whole Beatles story is loaded with that. It and is. um makes you appreciate how the Beatles got to be what they were with the combination of, uh, obviously, a lot of talent and a lot of hard work, but still quite a lot of luck. <laughs> so for those reasons, uh, I just I treasure this uh, first volume, and I can't wait till volume two comes out. Mm -hmm. So number one would have to be, guess what? Guess what? <laughs> Paul McCartney's new album. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, uh, you know, when we did a show on new, when it first came out, we were reviewing it, and I wanted to hold off saying what what my total feeling was, my, what my assessment was of this, of that album, because it was... I had played it so much in the past uh, week or two, um, and all the songs were in my head, and I felt, you know, don't rush to judgment here. Let some time pass, and give yourself, you know, some time to really, you know, let the album breathe for a while. I've always felt uncomfortable giving a, a quick judgment of anything. I, I, I've said a number of times, you can't judge an album after one listen, and I probably am the last person that should ever be a music critic, because uh, they all have to review albums with very few listens, you know, and, and write something very quickly. Tell and me I about think, it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how anybody can judge uh, an album of 12 songs or more and really get to know it and write something so quickly and, and it be a fair assessment of that work. You've got to have some time to distance yourself mm -hmm. from that work. And after a couple of months now, uh, I can fairly say it's a great album. <laughs> It really is. 
Uh, I, I do think it's one of his best. And I've um, rated uh, all the Beatles works group and solo uh, on a scale of zero to ten. And prior to this album, there were seven other albums from Paul that I considered a ten. And this is album number eight. So I, I really think that highly of it. There's, there's, I love every single song on it. Even the ones that I didn't like initially, like On the Way to Work, I've grown to love now. I love the variety on it. Like you said, Steve, there's, mm -hmm. there's so much. He is the king of eclectic. And I like the fact that he worked with four different producers because they bring out something different in him, I think. Uh, Paul looks for inspiration. And there's any number of ways that you can get inspiration. And if working with different people is what brings it out in him, then I'm all for it. You know, I love the rockers on there. I love when he rocks. Save Us and Queenie Eye are great rockers to me. I love the quirkiness of Alligator, which I think um, reminds me in some ways of Cage, the unreleased song from, from Back to the Egg. Um, I did say before that Looking at Her, which is a song that I, you know, after a few listens, it reminded me so much of It's Not True from Press to Play. And also reminds me a little bit of Yvonne. Mm -hmm. or Yvonne's The One, which was an unreleased song from the Press to Play Sessions. Uh, I love that. I love the atmospheric feel, the fireman-like feel of Road. I love the, the wings feel of Turned Out. Um, early Days is really... I, I don't know if there's any one song here that you can say is destined to be a classic, but Early Days could be. And I think a lot of it is because of the, the nostalgic feel of it and what Paul is saying in the song. Yeah, that's that. Uh, what Paul's saying in that song is going to carry that. He's going to keep that song in the forefront for a long time. Right, and also I can bet is an, is a such a favorite of mine, and I kind of wish it would be a classic because it's so damn catchy. Mm -hmm. And even the solo in the middle of the song there, which I think is a synthesizer, I'm not totally sure. I love the whole sound of that. I think um, if that got decent radio airplay. I think that could catch on. I think it could be, it could get more airplay than, say, Queenie Eye. But, um, you know, it's, it's really a tremendous album overall. I think that I love the production behind it. I love all the different sounds that come out uh, that you hear on, on the album. A lot of songs end with weird sound effects or songs that trail. They don't just end cold. And I love that. I like all the different instrumentation that was used. And... Um, you know, overall, I think it was just a superb effort. You know, the only the only complaint I have to make really is that I wish it didn't take so long as it did because I'm so used to having a new album from Paul every one or two years. Mm -hmm. But this one was, as we've said a number of times, his first of all original material since The Fireman, Electric Arguments, or if you want to call it a, a McCartney album, Memory Almost Full, if you want to go by the name Paul McCartney. So it was a very long wait right there. And, uh, you know, I'd rather have a new album from Paul every year, every couple of years, so the wait wouldn't be so long. The only criticism that I could make about this particular album, mm -hmm. I might have said this already, I'm not that big a fan of the processing of vocals. And um, there's a lot of it on this record. But I have gotten used to it to the point where I like it now. But I like Paul's voice just au naturel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't like, you know, a little bit of reverb is fine. But sometimes there's a little bit too much of either his falsetto voice. And sometimes the, what's being done kind of matches the, the sound that they're going for, like on Appreciate, which is another song that I really dig a lot. Very, uh, it's got a, a, a kind of a dance groove to it. He even said that um, in that documentary called Something New that he was listening to Usher at that time. So he was looking for a sound on one of his songs. And, but his, his vocals on there are just very soft. You know, and some it, it kind of matches the song. You know, I like I like what he does with that song, but I like his natural voice more. And I sometimes wonder if he's trying to cover up that maybe his voice isn't as strong when he does all these things. And that's something that I question. Mm -hmm. Although you know, I've seen him live, and he still sounds fantastic. He sounds amazing for his age. So I still think that you know he can still belt it out and have incredible vocals. I don't want so much of the falsetto voice or the softer vocals. But um, that's the only criticism that I could make of the album. But as far as all the songs, 
and the production behind it and the arrangements and everything around it i just uh, i just think it's it's absolutely brilliant what about the uh, use of the producers you don't have a problem with that obviously no but i will say that having watched that documentary is something new i kind of feel like paul trusts the producers too much <laughs> he goes by their instinct and in the case of early days and we talked about this before the very beginning of the song in the uh, first couple of lines it sounds like his voice is cracking mm -hmm. and for some people who want that perfect voice of paul they may not like that a lot right and paul played it for ethan johns that way and ethan said no leave it it shows your vulnerability well i don't know if i necessarily agree with that but then there are some people who like uh, you know, Paul, just as he is, don't try to be perfect. It's like the people who like demos more than polished recordings, you know? Right. So, I don't know. It, it's, I think it's, it's really strange in a way because Paul McCartney has had so much more experience than all these producers. What he knows, the knowledge that he has, he could be teaching them. But he's, he's relying on their expertise and what they've learned from their experiences. And he's, he's respecting them. I mean, <laughs> Paul is a great producer just by himself. Right. You could just easily say he doesn't need other producers, but he seems to want to have other people there to, to add some input and some ideas. And so, you know, you can tell. And I really enjoyed that documentary, by the way, the Something New documentary, mm -hmm. how much he enjoys other artists. You know, there's a, there's a scene in there where you see him embracing or kissing you know, certain people, whether it's um, Stevie Wonder or Elton John or Brian Wilson or Tom Jones is there. And, oh, Glenn Campbell. And I remember when he was at the Grammy Awards, how he was out in the audience and he was bopping to Glenn Campbell. Right. You know, and Adele and people like that. He, he appreciates these artists and he appreciates the producers that work with these artists. And so he turns to them to help him out with his own music. So he shows an, an enormous amount of respect for people who haven't had nearly the amount of experience that he's had. You know, there are, there are times in that documentary where one of the producers was saying, oh, I came up with this great idea, and then I realized Paul did it a long time ago. <laughs> it's, it's pretty extraordinary when you're working with people who, in some cases, may be, you know, half your age, and, and you're trusting their judgment, you know? Right. <laughs> This is someone Paul has done quite all right for himself on just his own instincts. So I find that aspect very fascinating. But New is just an amazing album. So what can I say? It, it has to be, for me, the number one choice uh, of the year. Okay. Sounds, sounds good. <laughs> so some honorable mentions very quickly. I think the Howlett book, the Howlett BBC book, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fantastic book. And... Um, it's a great companion to the BBC uh, releases. Right. And it's got everything you ever wanted to know. <laughs> so I think that would be that would be one thing uh, that I would definitely mention. Um, I'm going to... Uh, I know we weren't going to get too heavily into events, but I think the, the Ringo exhibit in Los Angeles needs to be mentioned. Uh-huh. I think that's, uh, you know, the fact that he poured out his... went through his archives for that. Uh, I think that's that's a really good thing. The Julian Lennon Everything Changes album is a great album. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic album. Um, Agreed. In its second in its second version, and uh, I think that's definitely needs a mention. And the other event I'm going to mention is uh, the passing of Tony Sheridan. Um, I think that was uh, that was very it was uh, significant enough that both Paul and Ringo made a statement about it, and I think that also needs to be mentioned. So, well, we I, we're, I, I thought we were talking about highlights, like happy occasions. <laughs> well, happy. I, 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 I was kind of getting into significant things there, but okay, okay, whatever. All right. Well, I have similar uh, honorable mentions. I okay. did put down Kevin Howlett's book, and uh, like you said, Steve, I love the fact that it's so complete, and the fact that um, you know most BBC material that Kevin Howlett's written about has been about the radio recordings, and this one combines the TV, and it's got it all chronologically. And um, just everything about the book. The, um... I, I recently picked up the... I had the, the first book he did. And I recently got a hold of the second one uh -huh. just to have it. Just to, I, know, I realized that, you know, that everything is, 
is probably covered in, in the new book, but I, I got it anyway just to, to add it into my library. And, uh, I mean, he's he's been a great chronicler of, of Beatle history, and I don't think he gets enough credit for that. So Right. I agree with you. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot, a lot in that book. Mm-hmm. There's transcriptions from interviews, especially the Pop Profile series, which was on on, on the on-air compilation. Mm-hmm. Um, audience reaction to radio programs and TV programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, how the BBC treated the Beatles. You know, the, there was um, the letter that was written to Apple, but uh, their concern about a day in the life and not wanting to air it. You know, things like that that I find you know, pretty fascinating. But it's nice to have a lot of that stuff there in that book that you might not have heard about, heard about, right. you know, especially a lot of the TV appearances. Mm-hmm. I also put in James McCartney's album, Me. Okay. And, uh, I mean, this guy shows a lot of promise. And I'm not saying that because he's Paul McCartney's son. I'm saying it because, for one thing, he's got really strong pipes. I mean, he can really sing. And all you got to do is listen to his records or see him live, and you'll know that. I had the chance to see him in a very small club in New Haven, Connecticut, called Cafe Nine. The place was packed like sardines, and you could only fit maybe 50 people in there. And you're, you're practically under his nose while he's performing. And he did a solo, sh- a solo tour this year where he played piano and, and guitar, and he was phenomenal. And these songs are very well done, great melodies. He's got a you know great gift for melodies and for lyrics. I think that um, he shows enormous promise. He's released two EPs before this, but this is his first full album. And actually, David Kahn produced it, who's worked with Paul right. on uh, Driving Rain and Memory Almost Full. And Paul even appears on the album, although mm-hmm. you wouldn't know it unless you were told. But um, yeah, James McCartney, I think he's, he should definitely check out Okay. This guy, because I think that uh, he has enormous potential, and I hope that radio will give him a chance. You have to wait and see. Uh, good old Frida, I had to put in there an incredible documentary. It's easy to fall in love with that woman because she's just, you know, she's so down to earth. <laughs> yes, she's the kind of person you just want to hang out with, mm-hmm. and uh, just the the idea that she never told her story before. I know that's what that's what's so wonderful about that that she never did and it's from the angle of something that we haven't even explored the fan club Mm -hmm. you don't find that written about in in, in the Beatle books too much and she was right there front and center and working for Brian Epstein Mm -hmm. so definitely uh, a wonderful wonderful documentary and like you said Julian Lennon Everything Changes I do think that is a perfect album it's so well crafted, and um, I know I wrote a review about this album where I just said, "Imagine if you had, if you took the time to work every song the way exactly you wanted it, so that everything was just as perfect as can be. The arrangements are perfect. His lyrics are very insightful, very personal, uh, really strong." The melodies, he has an incredible gift for melodies. And anyone mm-hmm. who's followed his career will know that anyway. This album is his first new album. Well, it first came out two years ago. And it's been re-released with two new songs, one of which has Steven Tyler on it, called Someday. And all the songs are just perfect. Right. They really, <laughs> I, are, they really are great. This it's is really, as flawless really an album as you could possibly get. I mean, and his voice is, is tremendous. You know, I feel for the Beatles' sons in many ways because I I do think that they're tremendously talented and they're always going to have people in the media and even fans that will say, yeah, but they can never be as good as. And so if they gave this music a chance, just like with James McCartney, Danny Harrison as well, you know, I think they'd be pleasantly surprised at, at, at what they'd hear. So um, my other honorable mention is the Ringo at the Ryman DVD. Mm, okay. which I thought was phenomenal because not only was this a great band, his most recent band with Steve Lukather in there and Greg Raleigh and Richard Page and Todd Rundgren, uh, but uh, the camera work was just extraordinary. They must have had 10 cameras going on at the same time. Yeah, because they I, captured, I think they did, actually. They captured everything in that mm-hmm. show. Tremendous camera angles, you know, great shots of two musicians together. You know, you might see Greg Raleigh at the keyboards and... Right behind him is Steve Lukather on guitar. And it's just the way that it's done. It, it's just so 
well produced right. as a DVD. The music itself is phenomenal to itself. And I love great concert films where it's focusing mainly on what's going on on stage. I don't like slick productions. I just like concentrating on the musicians. They're playing different shots. Yes, there's audience shots too, but that's fine. They don't overdo it with that. And um, it's, it was just so well produced. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's a crime, not only with this Ringo with the Ryman DVD, but with, with all of Ringo's live concerts, that it's not shown on television more because he's put together so many great all-star bands. And this is the kind of thing that would just be so perfect for PBS television or even uh, VH1 Classic or a Palladia channel, not only because the music's great, but because he's got so many incredible musicians. It's a mm-hmm. fascinating watch. You know, and just like I've said, anyone that goes to see Ringo and the All-Stars, especially just the casual fan who doesn't even bother to buy Ringo's music, they're really blown away (laughs) by these shows. They're very surprised at how good this whole concept is of the All-Star bands. And it's it's been a well-oiled machine now for, for Ringo since 1989. So and this is just one of the many examples of it. But in particular, I don't just love this dvd because of the music it's really the camera work is just uh, it's amazing it really is i would definitely recommend uh picking up that dvd okay so that's it that's it (laughs) another year we survived yes so here's to another really good year uh next year i do hope uh you know we get uh, a new album from ringo I'm sure we're not going to get a new one from Paul, but we'll get some remastered albums. And yeah. um, who's to say what um, posthumous releases we'll get from John and George? And then there's so much talk about what could come out on the Beatles. So, uh, you know, it could be a very interesting year. And, of course, we've got that 50th anniversary coming. So the Beatles will be in the news quite a lot. Yeah, uh, if that if uh, the rumor is true, we'll... See, we'll finally see that DVD collection that uh, we've been hoping for uh, all this time. We'll see what happens. What Steve is referring to, I mean, mm-hmm. you're assuming everyone knows this. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming everyone knows. But there have been some rumors, some reports that there will be a DVD. There was a website that actually had it listed. Yeah. That initially I didn't put any faith in. However, they nailed the CD, uh, Capital Albums box set right. on the nose. Mm-hmm. And so it'll be interesting to see, and the and the the uh, website or the the graphic is no longer up; it's been taken down. Mm-hmm. So somebody didn't like it, and um, maybe it meant more than we thought it did. Yeah. So, who but knows? the DVD that we're referring to, we still haven't told anybody we what still this haven't is. Told it. Yeah, we haven't. It's a a one. It's a, a collection of videos based on the one album. Mm-hmm. And I and and bootleggers have beat have beaten them to this. I mean, there's been you can you can find bootleg collections based on the one album now, but apparently that's the idea that they're going to do it for real. Right. I have so a feeling it, it could do really well. I mean, the one album was the biggest selling release of of the decade from 2000 to 2009. Right. So we'll have to wait and see if the the bootlegging of this will in any way affect the sales of it, but it's a great concept. I mean, this oh, is so long bootleg, overdue. I don't think the bootlegging is going to make any difference at all. I think especially the the um, the quality of the Apple version will will definitely do a lot. Mm-hmm. It should be superior. <laughs> it should be. Yeah, so, and that will come out, when did you hear? I don't, it, have, the, I don't have the graphic in front of me, I but think later it's in, in the second in, half of the year, I believe it is. I think it's in the fall. Yeah. And a vinyl box set for uh, the mono. Yeah, releases. that was announced already. That, or they, they already, they already said that was going to happen, and that'll happen probably closer to the end of the year, also. Mm-hmm. Okay. So well, we shall see. Well, this has been great. Looking back at the year 2013, and uh, for all of our listeners, we want to thank them for tuning in to us in 2013. Thanks for thanks for listening to us in 2013 and we will see you in 2014 all right so thanks so much for tuning in i'm ken michaels for things we said today and i'll see you next time and next year 
And this is Steve Marinucci saying we will see you next time. There we go.